Okay, everybody, how are you guys doing? This is Peter again. Today we're on chapter nine, patient assessment. Uh, this is actually a pretty important chapter because all of the skills and everything you learn uh, after this chapter is based on the information from this chapter. So when you do a patient assessment, this is where you're gonna find your injuries. This is where you're gonna find uh, the medical issues related to why you're there for that patient. So knowing how to do a good patient assessment uh, allows you to apply all the skills and knowledge that you learn in all your other chapters. So in our introduction here, EMTs must master the patient assessment process. It's divided into five main parts. If you have your skill sheets out, you can follow along with your uh, medical and trauma skill sheets and you'll see those five sections uh, on those skill sheets. All right, the first section of your skill sheets, the first part of your patient assessment is that scene size up. The scene size up occurs as soon as you are dispatched to a call. So you, as you're dispatched and you're responding to a call, you're thinking about, okay, what is going to go on in this situation? If it's a motor vehicle accident, uh, how many cars were involved? Is it on a busy highway? Are the police coming if it's a, a traffic issue or if it's an assault? Uh, what other resources are on their way? If you get told in the dispatch that a car crashed into a power pole, you want to know, hey, it's the electrical company en route. All right, these are all part of that scene size up. In many cases, the scene size up is sort of intuitive. It's just there, you see what's around you. You're listening for things, you're smelling things, you're hearing things. You're using this whole, all your senses to figure out what is going on. Uh, just be aware that sometimes your dispatch information is incorrect or incomplete. The biggest part of your scene size up and the first step is always going to be scene safety. If the scene is not safe, you do not proceed. If you get dispatched to uh, a home and you get inside the home and you see that there are some dangerous dogs, you leave. If that means the person dies, well, the person dies because you need to go home that night. Your partner needs to go home that night. You cannot work in an environment in which you could be injured or killed. So we always have our scene safety. We always have our gloves on. If you're on the road, you always have your traffic vest on. So it's always important to do your scene safety issues. Some of the types of hazards that we encounter. Uh, obviously, you guys can read the PowerPoint. We're talking environmental. It's a monsoon storm, you have lightning, you have heavy rain, you have winds. That's going to impair vision on your part. It's going to impair visions of drivers if it's a motor vehicle accident. Uh, physical hazards, what, what's in the way of you getting to your patient? Is it something that you can move or is it something that you need help to move? You have your chemicals, electrical issues, water, fire explosions, physical violence. Uh, and the patient being violent is also a big uh, safety issue, all right? You can have a scene that's very safe one moment that can rapidly change and become unsafe. Uh, maybe the family have a, a dangerous dog and it's locked in a room and while you're assessing the patient, that dog gets out of the room. You can leave. It's not patient abandonment because it's a safety issue. Uh, if you're working with a patient and the uh, car catches fire, and if you need to do an emergency move and pull that patient out quickly without doing full C-spine, uh, that's something that you can justify because it's life over limb uh, if you can get the patient out, but you don't want to, the patient's trapped and the car is now on fire, you need to leave that patient because uh, you don't want to get killed in the ensuing fire that may kill the patient, but you need to get out of there. It's a safety issue. The next step is determining the mechanism of injury or the nature of the illness. So most of our uh, calls, we're going to diagnose or separate into a trauma, which is an injury, or a medical condition. But understand that sometimes there is both a trauma and a medical issue going on. So we refer to our traumatic injuries as your MOI, your mechanism of injury. It can be blunt force penetrating trauma. Uh, when we're thinking about our injuries, it can be as simple as a stubbed toe. 
that is a trauma and it can sound really bad on the radio right traumatic injury uh foot and you you're thinking oh wow they they cut their foot off or something and you get there and it's a stub toe that is a trauma does it require a trauma center of course not does it require an ambulance of course not but people call for things like i broke my toe and they call 911. the second category when we do our patient assessment would be that nature of medical illness this is where you're going to use the acronym sample you're going to learn how to ask the questions to find out what's going on uh, that day with the patient that uh, gave them some sort of medical issue is it a chronic medical problem they just don't want to deal with that day is it a acute medical problem that came upon suddenly uh, so that's going to be part of your questioning uh, and again this is part of your uh, scene size up so you're not really interacting with the patient too much during the scene size up it's more of what you see uh, uh, when you get to the scene and what you hear from dispatch uh, if you see multiple patients on scene think that there's some sort of chemical issue the scene is unsafe you get uh, dispatched to a warehouse for uh, multiple people ill or acting abnormally that's going to become a hazmat issue the scene is unsafe hold off let the hazmat people get there and if in the process people die well people die you get to go home safe again that's the big thing about this scene size up making sure you're safe and getting a big picture of what's going on uh, on that call and determining whether or not uh, con considering the mechanism of injury and that nature of illness uh, is real important when you're getting dispatched to the call so your mindset you know you get dispatched for chest pain you're running through uh, your head okay what do we do for chest pain uh, you're you got an MVA and you happen to know that the motor vehicle accidents on a highway you start thinking about the forces that are involved with a high-speed accident versus is it an MVA on a back road not saying that you know the little side road you don't have people speeding going 70 miles an hour but you can almost guarantee that if the accidents on the freeway you're looking at speeds in the 60s and 70 miles an hour your standard precautions always have our PPEs I personally want the gloves on before you get out of the ambulance have the gloves on as you're pulling up on scene if you're not driving uh, hand gloves to your driver so they can get them on as soon as they get on scene because you don't want to get on scene and you jump out and the gloves are in your pocket and you start talking to this patient and then you start touching the patient and oops I got to get my gloves on and it's Tucson it's Arizona you're hot you're sweaty putting gloves on when your hands are sweaty is actually a, a pretty difficult task in, in some uh, in some ways so mask and goggles as needed uh, in today's environment we're wearing masks on almost every call protective goggles uh, are also pretty standard things that we're looking for as that can harm us uh, outside of like electrical and chemical things we're looking for needles that might have blood uh, blood and sheets blood on clothing bodily fluids uh, signs of communicable diseases uh, our dispatch centers are frequently asking certain questions when people call in uh, such as do you have a cough do you have a fever have you been outside of the country so that is very often given to you prior to you arriving on scene but the good rule of thumb is everyone has every infectious disease out there treat them accordingly patients do lie about what they have uh, because they don't want to share their illnesses and so just assume that people are infected with COVID, Ebola, hepatitis, HIV, everything under the sun and if you're that person that needs to wear goggles and a mask and gloves wear the goggles and the mask and the gloves if that's what you feel is the appropriate response and everyone else can deal with it because it's your safety that you have to worry about some people get a little lackadaisical and they they don't wear a mask when they should they don't wear goggles when they should uh, they don't think they look cool 
But one thing with COVID-19, society, and EMS has sort of gotten over that issue of people wearing masks and goggles as they come into your house and assess you. All right, and here we talked about, as I mentioned just before, get those gloves in place and we consider those glasses and a mask. Next step, so we have our scene size up, BSI scene safety. That's step one when it comes to our scene size up. Step two is the mechanism of injury or your nature of illness. Step three, and this is just like on your skill sheet, is the number of patients. Sometimes they'll tell you in dispatch, sometimes they have it wrong. You get there, if you are already overwhelmed by the number of patients before you do anything, call for help. If you need to set up an incident command system, start that straight away, but you'll want to at least let your dispatch, hey, we're on scene with this two car MBA. Uh, we actually have 15 patients on scene. Go ahead, start on the first alarm medical. I need so many ambulances, so many fire departments. Uh, we're gonna declare a mass casualty scene at this time. Then begin triage. And as you do your triage, you can update dispatch with the conditions of multiple patients, but you wanna get those ambulances started because they might have to come from long distances if it's a uh, large scene. Look for those additional resources that's gonna be calling for help. So not only may you need manpower, maybe you have a patient that's 350 pounds, but maybe you're a BLS unit and you need some advanced life support unit. But if that advanced life support unit's 30 minutes away and you get this patient loaded up into the ER in 10 minutes, don't wait 30 minutes for a paramedic. Your goal is to get, to that, get that patient to the higher level of care. So if you can get that patient loaded safely and transported to the hospital and to the ER in 10, 15 minutes, you don't need to wait around for a medic, but justify that in your report and let them know why you did that. If you're far out in a rural area, start a helo en route to the call. Don't drive the 45 minutes and get there and go, oh crap, we need a helicopter. If the dispatch information indicates that you might need a helicopter, start the helicopter. Call in fire departments as needed, law enforcement, uh, gas company, electrical companies, uh, these are all things that you want to call, uh, consider for your additional resources. And then we get back to the calling for help. Does the scene pose a threat to me? Can I handle any of the threats that are on scene? You know, do you need to call law enforcement every time you find a dirty needle? Probably not. Can you handle that dirty needle? Probably, but make sure you know that's a threat. Uh, it just might not need additional resources. Then we get to our primary assessment. Certain, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the steps to the primary assessment, you're walking up to the patient, you know the scene is safe, this is the patient you've been assigned or this is the only patient. What I like to do, you go up, you're watching, is this patient moving? Do you see any life-threatening bleeding? If they're squirting blood from an artery, that needs to be stopped straight away. One of the leading causes of death in these mass casualty shootings uh, and explosions are patients bleed to death. So if they're unconscious, unresponsive, and they're squirting blood, well, the squirting blood indicates they have a heartbeat. Because if you don't have a heartbeat, you don't squirt blood. But if you don't stop that squirting blood, the heart will stop because there's no blood for it to pump. And doing CPR on someone who is blood out is totally pointless. So that's why tourniquets are now such an integral part of our uh, patient care and the use of a tourniquet to stop arterial bleeding is the first thing that we're going to do. So we get up to our patient, we're walking up, we see, we ask, hey, how are you doing? I'm Peter, I'm a paramedic, what can I do for you today? How is that patient responding to you? Are they tracking you with their eyes? Are they totally unresponsive? So you're gonna assess that level of consciousness and your ABCs. And in your skill sheet, you'll see that the first thing that you wanna say after you do your scene assessment, you see the patient laying on the ground, you're gonna to turn to the evaluator and say, you know what, my general impression is I have a 
24 year old female unconscious laying on the ground with no sign of uh, life threatening bleeding. Or I have a two car MVA with three patients. Uh, one appears to be ejected. Two patients seem to be trapped in their car. That's your general impression. And that general impression can help give you a priority of care. Now, as you treat that patient, you may decide to change that priority of care. For example, as a paramedic, if I have someone with chest pain, I can be on scene treating the chest pain, the patient may appear stable, and then I finally get that 12 lead, and they're showing that they're having a STEMI, which is basically they're having a, a heart attack. We're gonna increase that priority of care. I get dispatched to someone who's having a headache. And when I, obviously a headache is not going to be a, a rapid transport call. We might not even go there code three, but when we get there, maybe they're slurring their speech and they're showing signs of a stroke. I'm going to change that priority of care, change the priority of transport. So in that general impression, we're looking at the approximate age, sex, race, are they comfortable? Are they appearing as if they're in distress? Are they showing uh, problems with their breathing? Uh, what's their overall appearance? How are they sitting? Uh, are they crouched over? Are they laying down? Were they found in the front seat of a vehicle? Or are they in the back seat of a vehicle? Introduce yourself and I always, hi, what can we do for you today? Or what is bothering you today? and deal with that life threat. And one of the things that you guys will have a hard time with when you guys do your patient assessments uh, for your skills is we have to treat as if we're doing steps in a sequential manner. We're doing our A and then our B and then our C. But in reality, we're assessing A, B, and C at the same time. So we teach sequentially but we're performing in the real world simultaneously. So as I look at this patient, I am looking at their level of consciousness. I'm looking for bleeding. I'm looking at skin color. I'm looking at uh, physical appearance. I'm doing all of that at one time. But when you do your skill sheet, it's really important that you do everything in the order of that skill sheet. And when I get that general impression, we look at, is this patient stable? unstable or potentially unstable. Uh, we also like to describe it, are they sick or are they not sick? And you walk in and you see this patient and you're gonna have that gut feeling of like, oh crap, this person has to go. There's something wrong, they just look like crap. They're pale, they're diaphoretic, uh, they're bleeding out, they got major trauma. God, this person needs to go. Uh, other times it might take a little bit of your assessment before you determine how stable or unstable they are. So we assess level of consciousness. So we now have, uh, so we talked about our scene size up, but now we're on our primary assessment. We have our general impression. So it's what we see. And uh, now we have our, uh, we took care of life threats. So if they're squirting blood, put a tourniquet wherever you need to and whatever extremity, stop that bleeding. If you don't stop the bleeding, they're going to be dead within minutes. And well, there's no need to do an assessment at that point because they're dead. So we need to stop bleeding. So boom, tourniquet straight away. Now we go back to our level of consciousness. Uh, we use uh, one of our wonderful, wonderful little uh, abbreviations, mnemonics, whatever you want to call them to assess our level of consciousness. Uh, just know level of consciousness can be altered due to a variety of issues. It could, someone could be altered due to head trauma. They could be altered due to infection. They could be altered due to drugs and alcohol. They could be altered due to a medical condition. And your assessment is gonna hopefully narrow down what is causing this person to have maybe an altered mental status or an altered level of consciousness. The main one that we use to discuss level of consciousness is what we call AVPU. So this mnemonic, the A means awake and alert. Your average person is awake and alert. Doesn't mean they're not bleeding. Doesn't mean they're not in pain. It doesn't mean they're not unstable. 
this is the person you walk in, they're looking at you, they're answering questions appropriately. They're awake and alert. The V, the verbal stimuli, this is the person who's laying there, eyes are closed and you're like, hey, hey, wake up, and they look at you. They might not be able to answer you verbally, but they're looking at you once you verbally stimulate them. And maybe they can answer a question or two. Maybe when you call their name out, they look at you with their eyes and then they, their eyes go back down. So they respond to verbal stimulus, but they're not awake and alert. And maybe the next step would be they respond only to painful stimulus. So this person, you're yelling at their name or saying, hey, hey, what's up? Wake up, open your eyes. And they're not responding. So you take your fist, you make a little knuckle, a fist like this, you take your knuckles, you run them right there in the sternum, up and down, pushing on some pressure, it's called a sternum rub. Do they respond? Do they move? Do they moan? Do they groan? Do they reach and grab your hand and try to move it away? Then you're like, boom. Okay, we got some painful stimulus, wakes them up. Or are they totally unresponsive? Second part of the assessing of your level of consciousness, that's going to be that Conscious, awake, and oriented, so C-A-O times four. So do they know their name? Do they know where they're at? Do they know what time it is? And do they know what's going on? You get your person who's having a concussion and they uh, remember, they ask, hey, what's going on? Hey, you got hit in the head playing football. We're gonna take you to the hospital. Okay, and then two minutes later, hey, what's going on? Uh, you got hit in the head playing football, we're taking you to the hospital. Okay. All right. So that's a sign that they have an altered mental con uh, consciousness. And that, that term in which they, they repeat asking questions is called persever perseveration. They, 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 they have that short-term memory. They need to uh, keep asking the same questions. They can't remember it. Here we're looking at our immediate life threats. Again, I mentioned... We take care of immediate life threats, which is squirting blood before we do ABCs. Uh, you won't get points taken off if you put a tourniquet on before you go my LOC, ABCs. It's all part of the primary survey where you will get points taken off if you start doing secondary survey stuff before you take care of your primary survey. So your primary survey, again, general impression, level of consciousness, life threats, and your airway breathing circulation. And again, this is all done simultaneously, but when you're doing your skill sheets, remember sequentially. And as it says here, in, uh, in, most, in some cases, it's most appropriate to assess life threats to circulation first, which is circulation, airway, breathing. That's what CAB stands for versus airway, breathing, circulation, again. Someone who's squirting out all their blood isn't going to be alive within a couple of minutes, so you have to stop the bleeding first. So you can take someone who is a priority one patient, critical, throw a tourniquet on them, stop the bleeding. That person is now a green, uh, low priority patient because maybe they had that isolated injury to an extremity with arterial bleeding, that once you stop the arterial bleeding, they can wait. How do we assess our airways? We look, breathing is not something that you should really notice. So it's sort of a look and listen. If you enter our house and you hear this patient wheezing from across the room, you have a breathing issue. The airway is open, meaning there's nothing blocking it. There's no food, there's no blood, there's no mucus. The airway is open. Uh, the patient's talking, they're crying. We love crying babies because a crying baby has an open airway, has a pulse, they're, they're great. Crying babies, we're not freaking out over. It's that baby who doesn't make any noise that we freak out over. Uh, but that responsive patient who's able to answer questions and talk to people. So when I introduce myself, hi, how are you doing? What can I do for you today? And they talk to me. I've already assessed my ABCs in, in less than 30 seconds. Because they're talking to me clearly. They're talking to me in complete sentences. Skin is warm, pink, and dry. There's no life-threatening bleeding. Boom, my ABCs are done. 
when it comes to an unresponsive patient, an unconscious patient, you have to be a little bit more thorough in checking that airway. You're going to assume if they're unconscious, unresponsive, unless it was witnessed that they have a head trauma. So you have to be careful in opening the airway. You're going to use a jaw thrust motion as opposed to a head tilt motion. But you look in the mouth, you make sure there's nothing in the mouth. If there's something in the mouth, you clear it. Consider that airway adjunct if they're unconscious. If they're breathing properly, you can give them a non-rebreather with 12 to 15 liters of oxygen. If they're not breathing appropriately, then you bag them. And you're going to bag the adult, you know, 12 to 20 times a minute. Uh, the rule tends to be less than eight, we ventilate. And greater than 28, we're going to want to probably bag them to slow it down because they're probably breathing somewhat shallow. So they're actually not breathing in a way in which the oxygen and the carbon dioxide can uh, do their interchange at the alveoli level. And again, airway adjuncts are something to consider. Uh, nasal airway versus an OPA. If you think it's something that might be reversible quickly, you might not want to drop an OPA because as soon as you start bagging the person and they start becoming more responsive, they develop that gag reflex. So now you have to deal with aspiration if you can't pull the OPA out fast enough. So think NPA. But you might not even want to go airway adjunct straight away until you, you ventilated the patient for a minute or so. Uh, just to see if that's enough to wake them up. Things that you're looking for with, when you're looking for uh, how they're breathing is, and especially for children and infant, you have to expose the chest because you can't see the retractions of those chest muscles unless their shirt is removed. All right, you can stick your hand on someone's the side of their chest, feel it. Are they breathing well? If they're breathing normal, again, breathing is something that you shouldn't really be able to just notice. Uh, when you see that person struggling to breathe, you hear gurgling, you hear snoring sounds, you hear wheezing, you see nasal flaring, you see the neck muscles uh, being used. They can only talk to you in a two or three word sentences or they're in this tripod position where they're sitting down, leaning forward with a hand down on the table, that, that tripoding. Uh, if they're a child and they're in the sniffing position, those are these signs that, okay, we got to take care of this breathing issue first. So you don't move on to C circulation until you have your B done, assuming that there's no life-threatening bleeding. So boom, before I check that pulse rate, we're going to put, put some oxygen on this patient, make sure that airway is open and the patient is breathing adequately. Things that we want to look at when we assess respiratory rate would be rate, rhythm, and quality. Uh, and again, with respiratory failure, the blood is not act, at, is inadequately oxygenated. So the patient is becoming hypoxic, which means they have low blood oxygen. We want our blood oxygen levels to be at least 94%. Uh, if the patient becomes hypoxic, you're looking at things like brain damage, hypoxic brain injury, uh, even if it's a uh, patient's just hypoxic for a little bit can cause hypoxic brain injuries, and we don't want that to happen. And then we have our circulation. Different ways to assess circulation, so mental status. Conscious, awake, and oriented times four. They're alert. I'm not worried about circulation. They're perfusing their brain properly. Their brain is working properly. Their skin, warm, pink, and dry. Or are they super pale, which is a Okay, are they going, are they shocky? Uh, check the pulse. What's the rate, rhythm, and quality of the pulse? For a conscious adult, we check the pulse in the radius. For an unconscious adult, we check the pulse in the carotid up here. And for an infant, whether or not they're conscious or unconscious, we always check a bradial pulse or brachial pulse in an infant. So we palpate, which means feel. Uh, back to lungs, I didn't mention the word auscultate, we, meaning that you're listening with the stethoscope. We auscultate lungs, we listen for lung sounds. Uh, we palpate for pulses. If you cannot feel a pulse in an unconscious, unresponsive patient, you're gonna start CPR. 
And when we start CPR, remember, we always start with compressions. And when you took your CPR class, you should have learned when you assess for breathing, you're assessing for circulation at the same time. So you're look, listening and feeling for air passing to and through the nose and mouth while you're looking for the chest to rise. And at the same time you're doing that, you have two fingers on the carotid pulse feeling for the pulse. So again, we, the skill sheets have you do things in a very sequential order, but in reality, we do things simultaneously. Other parts of circulation that I just mentioned, we're looking at the skin color. Make sure you know the word diaphoretic. Diaphoretic means wet or moist skin. We're looking at capillary refills. On the fingertips, you squeeze, you push down on the fingernail, and less than two seconds later, the skin should return to the warm pink color and not stay white. If someone's very cold or if they're shocky or if they're having poor circulation, that capillary refill is going to be longer than two seconds. What's the color of their skin? Are they pale? Sign of shock. Uh, jaundice or yellowing of the skin, sign of liver issues. Uh, flush red, sign of a possible allergic reaction or high blood pressure. Skin color is cyanotic, is going to be your blue skin, which is a sign of a skin blood not properly saturated with oxygen. In infants, it's not uncommon for a newborn to be a little cyanotic, and it takes a few breaths for that skin to pink up. And you can help by giving some blow by oxygen, but for the most part, just stimulating the baby, a newborn, will get, that, uh, get them breathing open up their lungs and get their skin to become the proper color of warm pink and dry. Skin temperature, we carry our uh, thermometers in the ambulance. Unfortunately, they're electronic. They sit in the ambulance and it gets to be 100 plus degrees back there. And sometimes our thermometers are not the most accurate, but you can feel that this skin's warm to the touch. Are they cold to the touch? Under Remember that if you put a pulse oximeter on someone who has really cold skin and poor perfusion to the skin, you're not gonna get a very good reading with the pulse oximeter. So again, you treat the patient, not the machine. Uh, I know it's just skin wet, moist, excessively dry or hot. Talked about capillary refill already. And we talked about external bleeding. Again, part of the primary survey, your primary assessment, whatever terminology you want to use is if there's life-threatening bleeding, it needs to be stopped immediately. If you just have some uh, venous bleeding, capillary bleeding, that can be addressed after you complete your head-to-toe survey, which is your secondary survey. You have your rapid scan. You've done your Primary survey, this is where you're going to do this quick look up and down the patient. Uh, shouldn't take more than a minute to a minute and a half. You're just trying to see any obvious life-threatening injuries that you might not have noticed initially. We go back to our transport decision now. So we know based on dealing with the primary survey, the primary assessment, the goal of that is to identify and treat any immediate life threats. ABC issues and, and life-threatening bleeding needs to be taken care of immediately. Now we can step back, okay, what priority is this patient? And some of these things that will make a patient high priority are they are unresponsive. But again, for medics, it might be different because if they're unresponsive and they have a history of diabetes, I might not need to transport this person straight away. Get an IV in them, give them some... Uh, sugar through the IV, it wakes them up, you make sure they have a meal. This person now is a patient refusal. We took care of the diabetic issue. Opiate overdose, boom, we get them some Narcan, they wake up, they're no longer a high priority patient. Uh, we look at our poor general impressions, difficulty with their breathing, uncontrolled bleeding, un uncontrolled bleeding, uh, not able to follow commands. These are some things that we consider high priority. Chest pain, shock, which is gonna be showing itself as poor perfusion, poor mentation, complicated childbirth, 
significant or severe pain, severe acute pain uh, would be other uh, high priority patients. So we want to get these patients to the right hospital within the first hour of when the illness or injury occurred. And that's going to be called your golden hour. When we look at transporting uh, critical patients, we look at what we call a platinum 10. A platinum 10 means from the time I'm on scene to where I'm transporting, I'm not on scene for more than 10 minutes. So this is just load and go, and anything that needs to be done, we do in the back of the ambulance on the way to the hospital. The reasons we use our helicopters now is if you're far out and they need to be in a trauma center, or they're having a heart attack or a stroke, and you got a 45 minute transport, and it took you 30 minutes to get there, you're gonna be outside of that golden hour. So you need to get that person flown to the hospital. Uh, so they're in that definitive care for a medical or a traumatic issue within an hour of that issue actually starting. Things that can determine whether or not you'll fly somebody or drive somebody would be their conditions, the advance, uh, availability of advanced care, the distance of the transport, and what are your local agencies? Do they fly people more often? Do they not fly people? Uh, that's going to be something that your agency uh, has protocols on. For AMR, it's pretty much a crew preference. Obviously, if you call a helicopter in to land in the middle of the city, you're going to get questioned. But for our units that work in the surrounding areas, uh, that's a call made by that crew going to the scene. And one thing when we dealing with priority of transport, we're always thinking about flying those trauma patients out, but we need to think about flying these medical patients out. If someone's having a stroke, you have about a three hour window to get them to definitive care. You can't give them an hour and a half ambulance ride to the hospital. Medical patients, when they're critical, need to be flown out, just like a trauma patient needs to be flown out. Our history taking. The mnemonic that we're going to use for history taking is sample. All right, your history taking are going to be things that we see, the signs and symptoms. So signs are what you can measure, temperature, blood pressure, pulse, respirations, uh, for medics, uh, your EKGs, uh, your pulse oximetry. Symptoms are what the patient tells you. Patients are not always great historians. So you sometimes need to rely on what you can see more than what the patient is telling you. And as you get more experienced, you will learn a little bit, you know, okay, this patient being very accurate or this patient not very accurate with their signs and symptoms. Other things you wanna know with your history taking, the date of the incident, the patient's age, gender, race, past medical history, current health status. If you have an unconscious patient, look in their wallet, look in their purse. If they're in a car, check their glove box. If they're at home, check their medicine cabinets, check their refrigerators, look for bottles of medicine uh, that might be on scene if they're unconscious and there's no one to uh, provide assistance. And as EMT students, highly encourage you to talk to family members, uh, especially the, the older family members and make sure they have somewhere written down their doctor's name, their medicines that they take, their allergies that they take or they have, uh, and that this is readily available. So if they ever have to call an ambulance, when people are freaking out because they have, they're calling 911, they can just hand this paper to the, to the medics and the EMTs that have that information available. We get shoe boxes of medications given to us. Some of the medicine, medicines in the shoe box are three, four, ten years old, and you have to investigate. Okay, this is a high blood pressure medicine. This is a high cholesterol medicine. This is a migraine medicine. This is a psychiatric medicine. So you can sometimes find out what a patient's medical problems are based on what medicines are prescribed to them. But if they're critical, you don't always have time to to play detective through 15 bottles of medications that are just handed to you in a shoebox. So one of the mnemonics we have a sample, another one is OPQRST. 
So sample, the S in sample is signs and symptoms. The A would be for allergies, M would be for medications taken, the P is past pertinent medical uh, issues, L would be last oral intake, and uh, for women, last menstrual cycle, and E would be the events leading up to why did you call us today? And we don't go, what was your last oral intake? We say that in a more uh, normal language. When was the last time you ate or drank anything? Your OPKRST mnemonic is what was the onset of this medical problem? You're not really gonna use this for trauma. I just got shot four times. That was the onset 15 minutes ago. But for your medical issues, when did it start? What was the onset? What makes it worse? Describe the quality of it. Is it a dull pain, a sharp pain? Where is this pain and does it radiate anywhere? Does it stay in your chest or does that pain go into your arm uh, and your jaw? Uh, on a severity uh, scale of one to 10, one being a little pain, 10 being severe pain, and then the timing of it, just similar to the onset, uh, how long has it been going on? Identify pertinent negatives. What that means, there are some medical issues that you wanna have no answers to. And so, and I mean by no, meaning the answer is no. So if someone is having uh, abdominal pain, you wanna make sure you've asked them, are you vomiting? No. Are you having diarrhea? Yes or no. Uh, have you eaten anything in the last three hours? Yes or no, all right? So you wanna make sure you've asked questions related to that. If you have a psychiatric patient, you're gonna ask questions. Do you feel like you need to hurt yourself? Yes or no. Do you feel like you need to hurt someone else? Yes or no. Uh, those, those would be your pertinent negatives. And then, sorry, this just sort of, uh, uh, again, just expands on that OPQRST, uh, the onset to clarify it again, what were you doing when the symptoms began? And then uh, the T is how long has it been going on? Already talked about sample. So again, this is that sample history I just spoke to you about. Uh, again, we always hear it. Sample is just gonna be one of those things. We're gonna hear about LOC, ABC, CAO, CAO times four, AF, uh, sample, and uh, OPQRST. Those are all these mnemonics that pop up, uh, become a second language to you as you take this class. Challenges with taking uh, patient history. They don't wanna answer, they talk too much. They have multiple medical problems and how do you determine what's going on when they have 10 different things that, are, that bother them every single day? Are they nervous? Are they angry at you? Are they drunk? Are they overly emotional? Best that you can do, maintain your composure, don't get aggressive, be calm, be empathetic, and uh, hopefully they can uh, become more comfortable and will speak to you. If you can't get a good history, you document patient was uh, intoxicated, unable to provide a good history. Uh, the worst thing is when you have this patient who's talkative and they tell you, no, I don't have any medical problems, I'm good. And you ask them like four different times while you have this patient in the back of your ambulance and you get to the hospital, you give the report to the nurse and the doctor, and then they turn to the patient and goes, hey, do you have any medical problems? And they give them like five different medical problems and you just look at the nurse like really and they look at you and it is what it is but again you just document if someone is confused you just document patients a poor historian of their medical history or a patient was uncooperative uh, if you have a patient that's extremely anxious or uh, we have a lot of psychiatric patients you know you've had success if you got the patient from the scene to the hospital without that patient becoming combative or jumping out of the back of your ambulance. So you didn't take a pulse, but you could assess circulation through skin color. Uh, you didn't take a blood pressure, but again, patient had a good mentation, so you know you're perfusing. And yes, you're in a perfect world, you take two, two sets of vitals on every patient, 
but if this patient is not cooperative, don't piss them off just by taking a blood pressure because you're told by your agency you have to get blood pressures on everyone, but you need to document why you didn't get blood pressures. And if the nurses give you a problem at the hospital, like, well, you needed a blood pressure, you know, patient was on edge. Be happy, they're here. They're not dead. They're calm, now they're at the hospital where they get the psychiatric help that they need. Sorry, I don't have a blood pressure or blood sugar on them, but I wasn't gonna piss them off. They were willing to come to the hospital. They got here, you guys get to treat the patient. So other challenges again, depression, confusing behaviors, limited cognitive abilities. So your patients with Alzheimer's, dementia, cultural challenges, maybe you're with someone who has a female, does not allow males to touch them or interview them. Language barriers, obviously, and I think we all know, talking louder to someone who does not speak English does not make them learn English. But it's such a natural reaction to speak louder, so just be aware of that. Hearing problems, vision problems, or all those issues that uh, can affect how you can do your assessment. Your secondary assessment. Your secondary assessment, you might not get to. If you can't take care of the life threats of a primary assessment, uh, because if someone's not breathing or someone's in cardiac arrest, you might never get to the secondary assessment. Uh, you wanna try, but it really depends on how many people you have. So if you have someone in cardiac arrest, you have people doing CPR, you might have someone do a quick pat down of the patient, making sure there's nothing going on that you missed that might be contributing to the cardiac arrest, but you don't always get to that secondary assessment. And depending on how critical the patient is, it may be done at the scene, it may be done in the back of the ambulance, or as I said, it might not be done all at, all, at all. And the secondary assessment is a systematic physical exam of the patient, starting at the head, going all the way to the toes, making sure you basically don't miss anything that could be causing some sort of problem. And even if it's not something causing a problem for the patient at that time, you still might wanna document. Uh, we get nursing home patients, for example, who have bed sores, and you're taking them to the hospital because they have an altered mental status due to a urinary tract infection. But you probably wanna document that they have a big five inch bed sore going down to the bone uh, in your report just so if it comes back in a, a lawsuit against the nursing facility, you have that documented. So here's uh, what we do to assess. We're looking for abnormalities. We're gonna be palpating to feel for abnormalities and we're gonna auscultate to listen to body sounds using a stethoscope. The mnemonic that we use is DCAP BTLS we'll go over what that stands for. And you're gonna compare the findings on one side of the body when the other, with the other side when possible. So what that means is we're gonna compare, for example, the, uh, the strength of the grip of the left hand to the right hand, uh, the strength of the left leg compared to the right leg. Make sure they're equal. So again, with this, it's systematic, and you go head to toe. You do not go head, to hips, to feet, back to the stomach. It is head, neck, chest, stomach, pelvis, genitalia, legs, feet, up to the arms. And it should not take more than about a minute and a half. And unless you come to something that is an immediate life threat, you're not treating things during this secondary assessment. You're documenting them. And if it is something that needs to be treated, you are triaging what you find in the order that you need to treat things. So we have our focused assessment. This is that person who has sustained the non-significant non mechanism of injury uh, on a responsive patient. So think of this person playing soccer, they twist or break their ankle playing soccer. It's an isolated injury to that ankle. 
there's no need to do a head to toe on this person. It wasn't a multi-system trauma. It's not a multi-system medical issue. It is, I broke my ankle. And they're conscious wagon oriented. They can tell you right exactly what's going on. So you do your primary assessment and you can go straight to that injured ankle. Doesn't mean you might not want to do a quick after you take care of that ankle, just a quick go around on the patient, making sure there's nothing else that you missed. Because uh, sometimes that ankle pain might be so severe they don't realize that they had uh, some other injury that they weren't aware of. So uh, you still might want to take a look. Uh, not maybe as detailed if it's a multi-system trauma, uh, but you definitely don't need to, uh, you definitely want to still take a look at that patient uh, head to toe, but you can go straight to that broken ankle or broken leg. Your respiratory system, so when you go from the head, to, when you're doing medical, it's more of a system check. You're looking for chest rise and fall. You're looking for a clear airway. You're looking for equal. Uh, symmetry of the chest, rising and falling, making sure there's no uh, parts of the rib cage that might be uh, in paradoxal movement from the rest of the rib cage. Are the lung sounds clear? Are they wheezing? Is there gurgling? Uh, measure the respiratory rate. So is it shallow? Is it deep? Uh, look for muscle, uh, accessory muscle of the rib cage, nasal flaring with that work of breathing cardiovascular system, you're looking for, again, you have your breath sounds, looking for trauma to the chest, bruising to the chest, uh, as we did with the primary assessment, pulse rate, uh, blood pressure, and we want to describe the pulses, rate, rhythm, and quality. The skin check, the pulses, distal pulses, radial pulses, uh, carotid pulses if they're unconscious, Listen to the heart tones, if there's reason, if there's chest trauma, is the heart, are the heart tones uh, clear or are they muffled, which will indicate that there's possibly fluid in the pericardial sac. This is a uh, table that everyone needs to know. It's just one of those things when it comes to your, your pulse rate. Just remember, the younger you are, the higher your pulse rate. And also the younger you are, the higher your respiratory rate. But the younger you are, the lower your blood pressure is at a normal blood pressure. So you can see on this chart that the range for an infant is anywhere from like 85 to 205 beats per minute. So you get a newborn whose heart rate is only 60 and you can't stimulate the baby to get that heartbeat uh, up, you're doing CPR on somebody with a heartbeat of 60. You have an adult with a heartbeat of 60, you're good, as long as they have adequate perfusion and mentation. Again, we talked about pulse for quality and rhythm and the blood pressure. Uh, normal blood pressures, you can see here, as you get older, just think high blood pressure is an adult problem. So as you get older, blood pressure goes up. Normal systolic blood pressure, 90 to 130. As you get closer to adult age, so when you, when you get these questions regarding children, the closer they are to being a teenager, the closer their vital signs are to what we just consider normal. Depending on what, what book you're looking at, uh, adults might be considered uh, age eight and up, or might be signs of puberty and up uh, is what's gonna be an adult vital. But for example, blood pressure of a 15 year old, is pretty much gonna be the same range as a, as a full grown adult. Your neurologic system, that's gonna be your mental status. Uh, again, what can cause a altered mental status in your head, rule out those types of things, head trauma, drugs, infection, hypoperfusion, uh, all are things that can cause neurological system issues. Do they have any sort of paralysis? Uh, your Glasgow Coma Scale, your GCS, that's another one of these uh, scales that you hear about all the time. There should be a chart in your book on what your Glasgow Coma Scale is. Uh, my advice, print it out, study it. I always refer back to it even after doing this for almost 30 years. Uh, 
It used to be nice when we had paper charts because it was actually on the back of every single paper chart so we could always look at it. At our computer charts, it's, it's written out, uh, you know, what's their mental status, uh, how do they respond verbally, and what are their motor functions, which are the things that your Glasgow Coma Scale will measure. When you do a head to toe survey, you're looking again, each body part, do they have that DCAP BTLS? And then when you look at the head specifically, you also want to look at the pupils. Are they pearl? Are they equal, round, and reactive to light? Are they dilated? Are they constricted? Uh, unequal pupils, uh, it's a sign of head trauma with head bleed. They're not necessarily trauma, sorry, head bleed. So it could be due to trauma. It could be due to like a stroke where they're bleeding inside. Uh, unequal pupil size is a, is a really bad sign when it comes to uh, uh, outcomes for a patient. So this is a good slide with constricted pupils. Again, in general, if we see constricted pupils, we're looking at almost always opiate overdoses or some sort of drug. All right, uh, there are some people who have uh, congenital unequal pupils, and they will tell you that if they're conscious. Mentioned Pearl already. So again, when you do your head to toe assessment, you tell that evaluator pupils are Pearl, you take that pen light, shine it into the light, or shine the light into the eyes, see if the pupils react. react. You describe them as Pearl, or you describe them as unequal, sluggish, unresponsive, dilated, constrictive, uh, whatever adjective you need to use. Neurovascular status, that's gonna be, do they have equal strengths? So if they're conscious, awake, and oriented, sir, I need you to grab my hands, squeeze my hands for me. And you want them to squeeze your hands at the same time, your left and right, so you can feel, do they have equal muscle, muscle strengths in the left and right hand? Uh, push and pull with your feet. So you can, does one side have more strength than the other side? And is this normal? If they've had a stroke in the past, they might say, yeah, that left side is a little weaker than the right. If you're treating this patient or assessing this patient for a stroke uh, and they're normally equal and now one side is significantly weaker than the other, that's a, that's a positive sign for a uh, stroke. Anatomical regions, again, we go head to toe, head, neck, cervical spine, uh, chest, abdomen, pelvis, extremity, and the posterior body, uh, or just the back of the body. Vital signs, the big three are always gonna be blood pressure, respiratory rate, and pulse. You have other things that you can measure now. You can use a pulse oximeter to measure pulse, uh, blood, pulse blood oxygen levels, but when in doubt, give them oxygen. If it looks like the patient needs oxygen, give them oxygen. Treat the patient, not the machine. Caponography is measuring their CO2 levels. Blood glucose is measuring their glucose level. If you don't have a glucometer and it appears that they could be having a diabetic emergency, you treat the signs and symptoms of the diabetic emergency. You don't need a glucometer to tell you. And when you get to your medical issues, if you're not sure if they have high or low blood sugar, you give them sugar because having someone who is acting uh, is have an altered mental status due to high blood sugar. If you give them a little bit more sugar, it's not gonna make them any sicker in the long run. But if that person's acting weird because they have low blood sugar and you don't give them sugar, that person very likely will go unconscious, have a seizure, go into a coma and die. So when in doubt, we give sugar. And then we take our non-invasive blood pressure using our standard blood pressure cuff. You wanna to try to get two sets of vitals on all patients, uh, three, if you have a longer transport or they're unstable, at the very minimum, you want to get uh, one set of vitals every 15 minutes if they're stable, uh, one set of vitals every five minutes if they're unstable. Uh, that's what a book answer will be, right? We reassess unstable patients every five minutes. But if you're trying to stabilize a patient and it's taking you more than five minutes, you're not going to stop what you're doing and be like, oh, five minutes are up. We need to reassess. Obviously, you're going to do your intervention and then reassess once that intervention is done. And if it takes six or seven or eight minutes, then it takes six, seven or eight minutes to 
to uh, do that intervention and then reassess. But uh, assessment wise, unstable patients, we reassess every five minutes. Uh, stable patients, we reassess every 15 minutes. Multiple vital signs allow us to have trends on how they're doing. For example, blood sugars. Let's say you're helping someone with low blood sugar uh, who's hypoglycemic. We get them some food. We have our initial blood glucose. We give them some soda, some orange juice, some sugary drinks, a sandwich. We check their blood sugar 15 minutes later. We see that trend is going up. We check it again 15 minutes later and it's continuing to go up. Hey, we have that trend. Now they're totally fine. We have that patient refusal. Uh, or if they want to go in, we can still go to the hospital and be like, here's our patient. This is what their sugar was on scene. We did this intervention, this intervention. This is their blood sugar now. They still wanted to be assessed in the ER. Their blood sugar is normal at this time. Uh, and you have documentation of the, uh, the results of your interventions. So as we just mentioned with your reassessments, reassess the chief complaint. Sir, how is your pain now? Is it better? Is it worse? Is it the same? How is your breathing now? How is the pain in your leg now that we splinted it? Uh, recheck your interventions. Is the oxygen still running properly? Is the tank empty? Is the mask still positioned properly? If you controlled bleeding, you put a tourniquet on, is that tourniquet holding still? Uh, any new life threats appearing uh, during your time with this patient? And again, right here, we'll see again, we're, we're reassessing every five minutes for unstable, every 15 minutes for stable. All right, the following are all your review questions. When we do our question and answer, we can go over these review questions uh, and discuss any questions or concerns that you have regarding any of the questions that are in this review on the PowerPoint or any other questions that you have following your patient assessment. Thank you very much, guys.